Well, thank you for uh, coming uh, in here to uh, listen to me talk about drones. It's such a beautiful day outside. I'm, uh, I'm surprised everyone's not outside instead, but I think I have some good stuff for you. And if you're interested in this technology, um, I'm going to kind of cover um, a broad spectrum of, of things that go into it. I actually taught a uh, class here a couple years ago uh, called Introduction to Unmanned Aircraft Systems. And this uh, contains a lot w w of what was contained in that five week class in fast fire format. So you're going to get a lot of that. Um, I do want to talk about the Northern Ohio Unmanned Aircraft Systems Association. Uh, we meet every two months at the Ohio Aerospace T uh, Institute, which is by NASA Glenn. Um, our, our goal is for the safe and non-intrusive implementation of uh, drones in the national airspace, and we have a focus on the, the uh, local economy. So there's 100,000 jobs going to come out of this industry by 2021, and the goal is to uh, foster a, a learned community around drones so that we can take advantage of that and get a lot of those jobs here and sort of be known as Drone Valley. Um, I'm a, uh, this is my company, uh, DroneWorks. Uh, we're located at the Lorain County Regional Airport. Um, we, uh, we manufacture drones, we sell drones, and we fly drones uh, commercially. We actually, uh, I'll brag a little bit, we actually uh, did the first uh, commercial drone flight in Cleveland on April 28th. So it was like a kind of an aviation milestone. Um, I will talk about NAWASA. This uh, picture up here is actually from the uh, 2014 Cleveland National Air Show. So uh, NAWASA and this team, we did the first ever drone technology demonstration at a national air show. Got a lot of national attention for it, so it was good for Cleveland. Uh, Dayton's are pretty active in this area, and then when that happened, they're like, what the heck, what's going on in Cleveland? So it was, uh, it was pretty good, we liked that. I got involved with the drones. I was actually working at the Fab Lab here. I had a part-time job at the, at the college. And at that time, I uh, became sort of enamored with the uh, manufacturing history of uh, Lorain County. And um, you know, a little sad watching you know, jobs sort of leave the area. And I don't know, it just it kind of bugged me. So I started to look and you know, what, you know, how are we going to redefine ourselves, like the elephant in the room sort of thing. And someone said to me, you know, technology is uh, the gazelle of the small business world. And I thought, hey, what, what in technology? And then one day I saw this guy. He's a, um, uh, a German guy. His actually name is Bjorn Block Christensen. He's a founder of Microcopter. And I had known about radio control aircraft and I had uh, flown some things. But this guy was doing stuff I never saw anybody else do. He was um, flying out. He'd put his control down and the aircraft would just stay where it was. He was attaching pop bottles to it and the aircraft would sort of adjust to the weight of the pop bottle. And then he did the most amazing thing. He flew the aircraft way out away from him. He put his uh, control down. He sort of did a little dance and then flicked the switch and the drone came back and auto landed and at that point I was just so amazed by that um, I was hooked and I was pretty much uh, you know a, a, a drone nerd from that uh, from that time on um, so this is just a, a photograph of um, an unmanned aerial vehicle and you maybe uh, heard terms that unmanned aerial vehicle unmanned aircraft system drone when we talk about the unmanned aerial vehicle we're really talking about the drone itself the actual uh, device that flies but when we talk about an unmanned aircraft system, and this is the term that the Federal Aviation Administration uses, we're talking about all the associated components, the computers on the ground end, uh, the joystick control, the payloads, which might be cameras or sensors and that type of thing. So uh, no, no real reason to be confused there. Unmanned aircraft system is just a uh, more broader term. So why do we want to use unmanned aircraft systems? Well, this is Audio Lilienthal, the Glider King, and he's a prime example. So um, Audio uh, Lilienthal, he made really the first hang glider, and he'd perform for huge crowds. And unfortunately, August 10th, 1896, he uh, met his demise when his glider sort of stalled out in the air, and he fell to the ground. So he's a prime example for why we want to use unmanned aircraft systems, and uh, those we refer to as the three Ds, dirty, dull, and dangerous. Obviously, um, it's dangerous to be in an aircraft in the, in the air. The, it's dangerous to crash. But we also want to um, use drones where maybe we have a dirty environment, a biohazard, a toxic uh, spill. Uh, when the, the nuclear plant in uh, Japan, uh, when they had a problem there, people talk about that would have been a great application because they didn't really know what the status of that is. They couldn't really go in. They didn't want to send a helicopter. Drones would have been perfect uh, there. Dull, when you're a, a search and rescue operation, is pretty dull. You're just kind of walking around looking for something. Um, that could do that task. Um, but even deliveries, like, you know, um, you know, driving can be dull. So having drones do your deliveries. Dangerous people are shooting at you. Uh, maybe a standoff situation with law enforcement. This is uh, where it all began, right? Um, Ohio, the, um, the Wright brothers. Um, December 17th, 19, uh, 1903 is the birthplace of, of aviation. Um, so we had the plane. Um, what, what really comes together to create a drone from an airplane are, are two things, and that is the radio, 
control in the autopilot. So this is, this is the radio control in the, the, the autopilot. The individuals that put that together are really Nikolai Tesla and Elmer Sperry. Nikolai Tesla, actually the 1896 um, uh, New York Fair had introduced radio control. Uh, he called it teleautomation, but it was the it was the ba basically the first radio control. He had this submarine that he showed, and he he uh, could radio control it, re control it remotely. He could submerse it, turn lights on and off of it, and he showed it to the U.S. military, and they said, "What are we going to do with this?" So it's kind of kind of interesting. Then you have um, Elmer Sperry. He comes up um, with a gyro compass, and this is what all modern aviation is based on. So you have these gyro spinning, and what you really create is rigidity in space. And what happens is as the aircraft moves, you always have that constant reference point. So that's how you can see where it's, it's rolling this way or pitching this way. You always have that constant. So he made modern um, uh, aviation navigation possible. Going from the autopilot, so this is Lawrence Sperry. This is Elmer Sperry's son. And he picks up where his father left off and he creates the autopilot. And basically what the autopilot was, was a mechanical linkage to the uh, the, uh, the gyro compass and it would control the aircraft. So as it was flying, if it knew that it was banking this way or banking that way, it could correct the flight of the aircraft and keep it level. Interesting thing about um, Lawrence Sperry is that he, uh, he flew the aircraft and he showed that he could demonstrate that he could uh, walk on the wing when the aircraft was flying. He didn't have to be even piloting it. And little side note for Lawrence Sperry, he's credited with founding the, uh, the Mile High Club. So. The first drone, this is kind of cool, was invented in Ohio in 1918, right? Only 15 years after the first flight, the first drone is invented in Ohio. And it actually is the work of, it's a true story of innovation because Charles F. Kettering, who designed a lot of aircraft, came together with um, the Wright brothers and the Dayton, uh, 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 the Dayton uh, uh, Airplane Company and basically went to Henry Ford, built engines, and then you had the first drone, 1918. Anybody have an idea where the word drone comes from? This is kind of interesting. It's the male bee. But why the male bee, right? That doesn't, that's not the whole story. That doesn't, that doesn't, okay, well, why the bee? So it basically um, goes back to this aircraft. This is the Haviland Gypsy Moth. And it was used by the Royal Air Force. It's a manned aircraft, but it actually was used in an unmanned capacity. So they put the electronics in it and it flew unmanned. Well, the the British, the Royal Air Force, called it the Queen Bee. Probably because they have a queen, I suppose. But when it came over to the United States, the American troops didn't, they didn't like the queen, maybe because they don't have a queen, I don't know. But they started calling it the male version, the drone. What's interesting, to this day, just like you have F for fighter and B for bomber, the Q from the original Queen Bee means unmanned aircraft. And this is the Q-47B, very modern aircraft, still using that Q from the original Queen Bee. So they come in lots of different forms. This is a fixed wing aircraft. Fixed wing traditionally require larger footprints to take off and land. So you need a runway to take off, and when you land, you need a, a big area to, uh, to land them, or you need a net to catch them. So they fly for longer periods of time, but their downside is they uh, need bigger areas to land. This is the DASH, the drone anti-submarine helicopter. Over 700 of these were built during the 60s and 70s, and they would actually look for submarines that could be threats to the ship. So they'd fly off the ship and, and uh, look for those. This uh, aircraft uh, had suffered from high vibration, and a lot of the sensors um, had problems on it. And even to this day, if you have a, a standard uh, style helicopter like this, you have problems with a video because they get an uh, effect called jello, where the video sort of gels around and doesn't look right. And that's from the vibration. So enter the uh, multi-rotor. This is a multi-rotor, and this is really a, a lot of the best of both worlds. So it has its vertical takeoff and landing, only a small footprint to take it off, and it doesn't have the high vibration of the standard helicopter, so you don't have that problem with the uh, optics on it. And basically, it's very, it's very easy to control once you get the uh, software inside there. And it comes in various formats. This is a, a plus formation. When you talk about plus formation, you're talking about that the, uh, the axis or the tube is on the front of the aircraft. When it's X, that means the front is between two of the booms. So that's an X4, um, a six, um, uh, X6, Y6. So these, um, this actually has two propellers on the top and the bottom to control. And believe it or not, the first multi-rotor, which is now really the iconic form of the modern drone, was invented, guess where? Ohio. 
in the 1920s. This is the Debozizat flying octopus. And essentially, this is a quadcopter that was uh, flying in Dayton in, in the 1920s. Uh, the, the project was abandoned because of pilot workload, so it was too hard to, for the pilot to figure out, I need to speed up this rotor, slow down this rotor. Um, but I guess the question, it begs the question, why were the multi-rotors in the 20s abandoned, but now we have, now they're all over the place. And it's probably due to what many of you have in your pocket right now, which is the smartphone. Drones are essentially flying smartphones. Um, maybe you have a, your phone, you turn the orientation of the screen and it, it moves the image. There's a little sensor in there that knows that you're turning it. Drones use a lot of these type of sensors. Also the uh, advent of modern GPS is a, a big part of it. Maybe you have a GPS in your car, you guide it. These drones can be guided the same way, auto automated. So this is a setup of a standard electronic diagram of a drone. You have motor controls that control the speed of the motor. Um, you have an autopilot that knows the position and orientation of the aircraft, a GPS to know the position of the aircraft. Um, you have a servo here. I'll demonstrate how these fly. So essentially, in its most basic form, the drone knows that it's level and it can keep it level. That's not the whole battle though because you can still, the drone, if it doesn't know its altitude, it could rise and fall. It can also drift one way and it could also turn. So in addition to that, what we add is a GPS. So now it knows its, its position in space where it is on the map. Um, we add a compass so it knows its heading, where it's headed. And we use um, a barometric pressure sensor which is just an electronic altimeter so it knows its altitude. What about up graph, down graph, how does that affect, the, does it affect the drone? Yeah, so uh, the question is up, down, drought, down graph, does it affect the drone? So essentially the drone knows where it is, how high it is, what the altitude is. So you have an updraft that blows the drone up, it's going to know to slow down the rotors so it, it goes back down. It actually um, senses and corrects its position 250 times a second. And that's why the modern drone can do what the original invention of the uh, quad rotor down in Dayton couldn't. The pilot can't think 250 times a second. And that's why um, this design exists today. The way that they fly is you, you control uh, basically three different aspects. And that is um, yaw, which this is yaw, roll, which is left and right, and pitch. You control all those, you control which way that it faces, which way it's going, and you can correct anything. If it turns this way, it knows to turn back. One other thing I'll mention is, so these uh, motors, they all propel the aircraft up, but some spin clockwise and some spin counterclockwise. And what that does is just, um, uh, you know, basic physics. If it's spinning clockwise, it tends to propel the aircraft counterclockwise and vice versa. So having um, um, equally balanced two counter, it, 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 uh, it negates that. But it, all, it also allows you to vary the speed so that you can turn if you want to. You can turn on the yaw. And the same thing, speed up, left side, slow down, and that's how it does the, the motion. So now we have the aircraft that knows exactly where it is and will stay there if we just leave it, if we don't put any control inputs into it. But now we can also add a ground control station. This is a modem link, it's a computer connection with the aircraft. We'll show you exactly where the aircraft is and you can go on here and actually just put in pins and say I want you to fly here. You can control every aspect of it. How, what the altitude is, what the heading is, where you want the camera to be pointed can all be programmed from the ground. Um, this even shows you the attitude of the aircraft. If it's leaning over versus the horizon, you can also have live video feed to, uh, to this. So all this technology comes together with some pretty amazing results. And I'm gonna show you a video now of what, some of what's being done. A camera bicon system and an onboard IMU for state estimation. Here we show single, double, and triple flips. It's doing tricks, flips. We developed a method for flying to any position in space with any reasonable velocity or pitching. We use the method to fly through windows through window. at various angles. Here there's less than three inches of clearance on all sides of the quadrotor. We also fly between other quadrotors. The same method can be used to descend or ascend through a horizontal slot.
placing Velcro on the bottom of the quad rear and on a target, the quad rear can perch on a surface. Here we demonstrate perching on an inclined surface. And now on an inverted surface. Pretty amazing, right? This is juggling. Play by yourself. Another uh, technology is being explored is using more than one drone, actually a lot more, and this is called swarming. We developed a nano quadrotor capable of agile flight. vehicles can fly as a formation. We developed a method to transition between formations in 3D. Also navigate in environments with obstacles. Pretty amazing, right? Any James Bond fans? It's actually done during the 50th anniversary of James Bond. But. lifelike right but it does uh, bring up an interesting area as drones for entertainment and uh, with the combining of swarming 
some are saying that these uh, drones could be the new fireworks, and this is a... So that was a demonstration that Intel did over overseas. So uh, practically, what uh, will drones be used for? Um, Two billion dollar industry in agriculture. So right now, farmers they have to uh, basically they have to walk their fields to see what's going on there, see what the condition of the crops are. With drones, we can look at the health of the crops. What may look at like just different shades of green to us, or maybe all the same uh, shades of green. Drones can use special cameras to see the health of the crop. So they'll. Uh, be able to notice subtle differences in the green color of whether plants are healthy. This makes our food healthier because it allows farmers to, uh, right now they sort of spray insecticide and uh, apply fertilizer prophylactically over the whole crop. But now they can look and say, hey, I, I have a bug problem or I have a mold problem and it only spray in the areas where it needs it. Saves the farmer money, but it also makes our food healthier by not having different pesticides in it. Um, another thing is that you can see where the irrigation is. That's a big problem for farmers, especially for fertilizer. They spend a lot of money on fertilizer only to have it run off their, their land. With uh, drones, you can figure out where it is and thermal cameras, the, the, the water is a different temperature and it shows up. The problems that they were having in Toledo with all the algae growing into the, the lake was a big problem and they can be avoided with this because all that fertilizer is expensive for the farmer, it runs off to the lake, causes environmental problems there. Now we can identify it. And this is actually uh, just, uh, Jeff Taylor with Event 38, which is a drone company in Akron. Aerial photography, $2 billion industry. This is actually a, um, an aerial photograph of the Illyria Falls, though. Uh, search and rescue. Um, can save lives, um, it can uh, find people faster. $178 million industry. Uh, law enforcement. Uh, 3D mapping, this is amazing. You can actually um, fly around and get contours and you can fly around buildings and actually see a, a 3D rendering of them. Enough, it's good enough to even uh, print out on a 3D printer. Uh, miscellaneous, uh, medical package delivery. Uh, this is a drone designed to prevent drowning. It actually d distributes life preservers. Get out there a lot faster than a, a lifeguard uh, can, and um, the lifeguard's life might not be at risk. Um, this is a concept for a drone that uh, delivers a defibrillator on the golf course. It's a, you know, if you have a heart attack on a golf course, you're kind of um, it's going to be rough to save you. But this could this could prevent that. All in all, 96 billion dollar industry by 21, uh, 2021 creating over 125,000 jobs, so it's a big opportunity. And Ohio definitely wants to get a, a you know, we, we'd like to have a big piece of those, 10, 20, 30, right? Maybe half of them. And there's a lot of reasons Ohio should be Drone Valley. Um, it's a birth, uh, birthplace of aviation. Um, I'll show you something here. Uh, as I said, the first drone, first quadcopter, all invented here, that's good marketing stuff for Ohio. Uh, one in 50 jobs in Ohio is aviation related. Um, these are obviously some of our local 
aerospace uh, resources, NASA, Crane Aerospace, Parker Aerospace, uh, Burke Lakefront Airport, um, the Smart Center here, um, Cleveland Hopkins, Discovery Aviation Center, which uh, is, educates uh, younger people. And a big resource for drones is the radio control community. And actually, out of the, in the United States, 10% of the radio control community exists right here in Ohio. And those are all the radio control fields in, in sight. A huge, uh, a huge resource. There's some obstacles. One is uh, safety. So this is a, a, f a photograph of a, a bird has actually gone through this uh, window here. And you know, birds aren't very substantial. They're sort of light. They have hollow bones. And you know, if a bird does this, we really don't want to see what a drone does when it hits an aircraft. And that's, that's bad. So this is a, um, a photo of a, aircraft, a manned aircraft and a drone. And we actually did, uh, NOASA did an experiment to see how hard it was for a manned aircraft pilot to see a drone and the drone operator vice versa. So here that is. That's a view from the front of the cockpit there. See, passes the drone, where is it? Drone's over here. Drone operator clearly see the airplane, but where is it? So we, uh, we made this just to show how important it is for drone operators. They need to be the ones to look out for the, the manned aircraft. Can't be the other way around. Some have criticized this video about the horizon. So obviously, if a drone was above the horizon against the blue and the, uh, the white of the clouds, maybe a little bit easier to see. But in actuality, the drone is probably going to be lower in altitude than the aircraft. So this is a real world scenario. You're going to have the ground clutter, and it's, it's probably going to be impossible for the pilot to see it. So another problem is, uh, so this is uh, Raya Ogden. She was completing the, the running leg of the Endura Batavia Triathlon in, in Geraldtown, West Australia. And uh, she was struck by a drone falling from the sky. So in addition to being cut by the, you know, basically the Ginsu blades, these are flying lawnmowers. These will, these will mess you up. You have, they have to be respected. But now that drones are easier to fly, they're ending up in urban environments. People want to um, uh, film people. And they're getting closer to people than ever before. Usually, you know, in the past, you take your radio control airplane to the RC field. No one's out there. You're flying around there. You crash. You know, maybe you damage some corn. But now, um, you have aircraft that are potentially hitting buildings and then falling. So it's not only the blades, but it's the uh, falling object as well. So you have to look out for that. So it's important to be uh, to know safety and you know, have a knowledgeable community around safety. Um, privacy concerns, right? So now you have um, the you know the eye in the sky that um, if you have, you put up a fence, no problem for a drone goes right over the fence, seeing you there. So um, a lot of common sense goes a long way. I think that you know you could probably legally put your um, GoPro camera on a stick and put it over your fence into your neighbor's yard, but you know they're not going to like it, right? You know they're going to get upset during their picnic. They're not going to. So I think, uh, you know, just a little, um, like I said, a little common sense goes a long way. Um, and there's general misconceptions, and I'll give you an example. So um, a couple years ago, I, I'm not sure how, but uh, maybe some of you remember, there was a house, a house explosion in Elyria. And this was a Supposedly, um, somebody had gone in there and maybe there was a leak, maybe it had been a scrap theft situation, but it was an unusually, as I recall, unusually warm fall. And what had happened is one night about 10 o'clock, and I remember it because I, I have uh, two little boys and like we heard this explosion and I thought it was on my porch, you know, I thought someone was like shooting at us or something. But uh, this is what happened. What happened is that it got cold that night, furnace came on, all this gas. Uh, built up and it obliterated this house and you can see this mass destruction here so I went over there and when I saw it I, I flew the drone up I took a, a quick picture of it and 
somebody uh, you know through the grapevine had got word of it in uh, Channel 5 and the Chronicle Telegram had picked it up and they put it on there and on the blog there are people on there saying I can't believe that the federal government sent a predator drone over Leary, Ohio to take a picture of this. What is our what is the federal government doing to us, right? So but these ideas are out there. This is what people I mean a lot of times on the news they show drone, it's a predator drone, right? So when I showed them like, no, it's this little, you know, two pound aircraft over here is what actually I used to t take it. That's called a three DR iris over there is the name of that. Um, people's eyes open. So but that, that still exists out of there. And just to show you a little bit about some of the ideas of that are that are out there in the anti drone sentiment. Um, I'm going to show you a little video. For, this guy named called Johnny Drone Hunter. actually an ad for a, a shotgun silencer company of all things so so a little uh, note on the uh, regulations um, there's different rules for ho hobbyists and commercial and public uh, operations um, you can find out information the one thing I would you know if you're a hobbyist I, I definitely would encourage all hobbyists to uh, join the Academy of Model Aeronautics um, it's a learned community um, you can get a lot of information um, that you get uh, two and a half million dollars of insurance with your annual membership, and they they send you a, a magazine every month. So it's it's not a bad it's not a bad deal. Um, all drones have to be registered now, so it's a five dollar process. You have to have the um, you have to put a sticker on it, or you can write in, in marker on it. It just has to be labeled with your your registration number. There's actually some pretty incredible uh, fines of two hundred fifty thousand dollars in prison time for not um, doing that. So um, uh, this information is available on the NUASA uh, website as well. You can get all this. Um, for commercial and public safety use, is a little bit more onerous. You have to go through a certificate of waiver of authorization process. So you have to actually tell the FAA about your operation, what you're going to do. You have to get an exemption. You have to fly with a, an actual licensed pilot, as, a, as crazy as that sounds. Um, so it's a pretty onerous process. There's, they're backlogged to 7,000 right now. Um, the relief that may be on the horizon is that if you want to do, use drones commercially, a new rule called uh, 107 is coming out at the end of the month, and it'll only require a drone, commercial drone operator to uh, take an aeronautical knowledge test. You have to have a background uh, check to make sure you're not a terrorist and that type of thing. Um, but it, uh, you won't have to have a pilot's license, and it'll allow you to do a lot of things commercially. So, but up to this point, it's been you know a field for just a, uh, a few. Um, the uh, new Rule 107 won't require you to have actually uh, flight uh, training, just an aeronautical knowledge test, but I think training is in, in extremely important and I think there's a huge opportunity, maybe for Lorain County Community College in training. I'm finding out is, um, I just had a meeting with uh, First Energy and they, uh, they said, well, we know 107's coming out, but that's not good enough for us. We want, if we're gonna hire pilots to expect um, transmission lines, for example, we wanna know that they know what they're doing, that they're trained on the aircraft. I'm also finding from insurance companies that they're asking where you had your drone training, how much flight time have you had, how many missions have you flown? So I think there's a huge training potential uh, here. There's a great need for it. 
So I know that um, um, Sinclair Community College in Dayton is really big on this, but I think people are going to look for this resource in a, in a, in a regional way. This is going to be such a demand for it. So that's all I have as far as the, the slideshow. I'll answer any questions, and if we have time, I'm going to go fly for you, I guess. First got involved in drones, which is in really like 2010, 2011. Just to build a basic one would have cost almost $30,000. So um, I sort of worshiped them from afar for a while. Now, today, you can get a, a pretty uh, reasonable, very capable drone that has a lot of those, the functionality I talked to you about with the, the ground control station and all of that for about 500 bucks. So that's like the, that's like the entry uh, price point. Uh, this, uh, this drone is a, a DJI Inspire which it's called a prosumer drone, so it's a little bit more out of the hobbyist realm. Um, has a, a better camera, a little bit more flight time. It's pretty advanced, it has, actually has retract, retractable landing gear. This uh, originally was around $3,000 to, to $4,000, and in this model, depending on what you get, you can sp spend up to $12,000. But even now, this particular model, you can get for $2,000 if you only, only want one control with it. Very capable aircraft. Something like this is more starting in the twelve, fifteen, sixteen thousand dollar $16,000 range, and a lot of it depends on your camera. So if you equip it with a, a cinematic camera, sometimes the camera costs a lot more than the drone, sixty, hundred thousand. dollars $100,000. The drones that are filming uh, Fast and the Furious, you'll probably have a $200,000 camera on a drone filming downtown. So that's a big part of it. If you want to do thermal cameras, sometimes the thermal cameras are ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 for those. So that's a big part of it. But um, this generally for a basic flight system, ten dollars to $12,000 on the, on the big one like this. And the reason you have it is you, this is all about payload so you're carrying you want to you don't need a big drone like this unless you're carrying something something heavy although these do these drones do have a little bit more staying power when you have heavy winds so that's another reason you might want to have it